Do rude things to you? I ask. She nods and swallows. She's nervous, and deep down I know where this is going. She's talking about the playroom. Are you ready for this, Gray? I rip open the tissue that conceals the box's contents and retrieve an eye mask. Okay. She wants to be blindfolded. Next are some nipple clamps. Oh. Not these. They're vicious. Not beginner level. Beneath the clamps is a butt plug, but this one is way too big. She's enclosed my iPod, too, which pleases me. She must like my music choices. And here's my silver gray Brioni tie, so she wants to be tied up. Last, as I suspected, there's the key to my playroom. She's giving me the big blue eyes. You want to play? I ask, my voice soft and husky. Yes. For my birthday. Yes. Her agreement is barely audible. Is she doing this because she thinks I want to? Is what we do not enough for her? Am I ready for this? You're sure. I prompt. Not the whips and stuff. I understand that. Yes, then, I'm sure. She confounds me. Every day, I stare down at the contents of the box. Sometimes she's just bewildering. Sex mad and insatiable, I mutter. Well, I think we can do something with this lot. If this is what she wants, and her words come back to me in a swirl. She's asked me and asked me and asked me. I like your kinky fuckery. If I win, Christian, you'll take me back into the playroom. Red room, here we come. I want a demonstration. I like being tied up. I place the items back in the box. We could have some fun. And that spark of anticipation flares and ignites in my gut. I haven't felt it since we did our last scene in the playroom. I regard her through narrowed eyes and hold out my hand. Now, I state, I'll see how willing she really is. She puts her hand in mine. Okay, then, we're doing this. Come. I have a million things to do since yesterday's crash landing, but I don't give a fuck. It's my birthday and I'm going to have some fun with my fiancé. Outside the playroom, I pause. You're sure about this? Yes, she says. Anything you don't want to do. She's thoughtful for a moment. I don't want you to take photos of me. Why the hell would she say that? Why would I want to take pictures of her? Gray. Of course you would, if she'd let you. Okay. I agree, concerned about what has motivated this question. Does she know? That's impossible. I unlock the door, feeling apprehensive and excited at once like the first time I brought her in here. I usher her in and close the door. For the first time since she left me, the room is welcoming. I can do this. Placing the gift box on the chest of drawers, I remove the iPod, place it in its dock, and set the Bose sound system so the track plays over the speakers. Eurythmics. Yes. This song came out the year before I was born. It has a seductive beat. I love it. Yeah, I think Anna will like it. Setting it to repeat, I hear the track begin. It's a little loud so I lower the volume a tad. When I turn to her, she's in the middle of the room, watching me, a hungry, wanton expression on her face. Her teeth are toying with her lower lip, and her hips are swinging in time to the beat of the music. Oh, Anna, you sensual creature. I amble over to her and gently tug her chin, releasing her lip. What do you want to do, Anastasia? I whisper, and plant a chaste kiss at the corner of her mouth, keeping my fingers on her chin. It's your birthday. Whatever you want, she breathes and her darkening eyes flick up to mine, full of promise. Fuck. She might as well be addressing my cock. I skim my thumb across her bottom lip. Are we in here because you think I want to be in here? No. I want to be in here, too. She is a siren. My siren. In that case, Let's begin with the basics. Oh, there are so many possibilities, Miss Steele. But let's start with getting you naked. I jerk the sash of her robe, undoing it, and it falls open revealing her silk nightdress. I step back, and sit down on the arm of my Chesterfield sofa. Take your clothes off, slowly. Miss Steele loves a challenge. She slips the robe off and lets it fall like a cloud onto the floor, while her eyes stay on me. I'm hard. Instantly, as desire sweeps through my body, I run my finger over my lips to keep my hands off her. 
She lifts both straps of her nightgown off her shoulders, watching me, watching her, and then drops them so her gown floats down her body to join the robe on the floor. She is naked before me in all her glory. It makes a difference, her eyes on me. It's more exciting because I can't hide anymore. I have an idea, and stroll over to the chest of drawers to retrieve my tie from her gift box. Running it through my fingers, I walk back to where she's patiently waiting. I think you're underdressed, Miss Steele. I place it around her neck and quickly tie it in a half Windsor, but I leave the wider end long. My fingers brush her neck and she gasps, and I let the long end fall so that it skims the top of her pubic hair. You look mighty fine now, Miss Steele. I give her a swift kiss. What shall we do with you now? I murmur. Taking the tie in my hand, I tug it sharply and she's forced into my arms. Her naked body against mine is like an incendiary device. My fingers are in her hair. My mouth is on hers and with my tongue I claim her. Hard. Insistent. I'm taking no prisoners. She tastes of sweet Anastasia steel. My favorite flavor. With my other hand, I cup her behind, feeling her fine ass. When I release her, we're both panting. Her breasts rising and falling with each breath. Oh, baby. What you do to me? What I want to do to you? Turn around, I prompt. She does so immediately, and I pull the tie from her hair and braid it. No loose hair in the playroom. I gently pull her braid, and her head tilts up. You have beautiful hair, Anastasia. I kiss her throat and she writhes. You just have to say stop. You know that, don't you? I whisper against her skin. She nods, her eyes closed. But damn, she looks happy. I turn her around and take hold of the end of the tie. Come. I lead her over to the chest where her gift box sits, displaying its contents. Anastasia. These objects. I hold up the butt plug. This is a size too big. As an anal virgin, you don't want to start with this. We want to start with this. I show her my pinky. Her eyes grow impossibly large. And I have to confess, one of my favorite pastimes is shocking Anna. Just finger. Singular. I add. These clamps are vicious. I poke the nipple clamps. We'll use these. From one of the drawers I take out a kinder pair. They're adjustable. She examines them. Fascinated. I love how she's so curious. Clear. I ask. Yes. Are you going to tell me what you intend to do? No. I'm making this up as I go along. This isn't a scene, Anna. How should I behave? It's a strange question. However you want to. And I wonder out loud if she was expecting my alter ego. Well, yes. I like him, she says. Do you? Now, I run my thumb across her lower lip, tempted to kiss it again. I'm your lover. Anastasia, not your dom. I love to hear your laugh and your girlish giggle. I like you relaxed and happy, like you are in Jose's photos. That's the girl that fell into my office. That's the girl I fell in love with. But, having said all that, I also like to do rude things to you, Miss Steele, and my alter ego knows a trick or two. So do as you're told and turn around. She obeys, her face glowing with excitement. I love you, Anna simple. I take what I need from the drawers, then arrange all the toys on the top. Come. I tug the tie and lead her to the table. I want you to kneel up on this. Gently I lift her onto the table, and she folds her legs beneath her and kneels in front of me. We are nose to nose. She stares at me with shining eyes. I run my hands down her thighs and at the knees gently pull her legs apart so that I can see my goal. Arms behind your back. I'm going to cuff you. I show her the leather elbow cuffs and lean around her to put them on. She turns and runs her parted lips along my jaw, her tongue teasing my stubble. I close my eyes and for a moment rebel in the contact, suppressing a groan. Pulling back, I admonish her, stop, or this will be over far quicker than either of us wants. You're irresistible. Am I, now? She nods, looking impertinent. Well. Don't distract me, or I'll gag you. I like distracting you. Or spank you, I warn. She grins. Behave, I scold her, and stand back and beat the cuffs across my palm. It could so easily be your ass, Anna. 
She looks modestly down at her knees. That's better. I try again, and this time succeed in putting them on. I ignore her running her nose over my shoulder, but I thank God for our shower in the early hours of the morning. The cuffs on, her back arches a little. Her breasts now prominent and begging to be touched. Feel okay? I ask as I admire her. She nods. Good. From my back pocket I take the mask. I think you've seen enough now. I slide it over her head and over her eyes. Her breathing accelerates. And I step back and drink her in. She looks smoking hot. Back at the drawers, I gather the items I need and slip off my t-shirt. I keep my jeans on, even though they are a little uncomfortable, because I don't want her distracted by my impatient dick. In front of her once more, I open the small glass bottle that contains my favorite massage oil and wave it under her nose. Infused with cedarwood, argan, and sage, it's body safe, and its fragrance reminds me of a crisp, fall day after the rain. I don't want to ruin my favorite tie, I mutter, as I undo it and pull it gently off Anna's body. She squirms as the material floats up her body, teasing her. I fold my tie and place it beside her. Her anticipation is almost palpable. Her body is humming with impatience. It's arousing. I pour a little oil on my hands and rub them together, warming the oil. She's listening to what I'm doing. I love heightening her senses. Gently, I caress her cheek with my knuckles and run them down her jaw. She startles when I touch her, but she leans into my hand. I start massaging the oil into her skin, her throat, her clavicle, and along her shoulders. I knead the muscles beneath and let my hands glide in small circles across her chest, avoiding her breasts. She bows backward, pressing them toward me. Oh no, Anna, not yet. I move my fingers down her sides, rubbing in the oil in slow, measured strokes in time to the music. She groans and I don't know if it's from pleasure or frustration. Maybe a little of both. You are so beautiful, Anna, I whisper, my lips close to her ear. I run them along her jaw as my hands work their magic. I move them beneath her breasts, over her belly, down to my goal. I kiss her quickly and inhale her scent, now mixed with the oil, down her neck and throat. And soon you'll be my wife, to have and to hold. She inhales sharply. To love and to cherish. My hands continue. With my body, I will worship you. She throws her head back and moans as my fingers run through her pubic hair to her clitoris. Slowly I palm her, teasing her and spreading oil over her where she's wet already. It's intoxicating. I lean over to pick up a bullet vibrator. Mrs. Gree. She moans. Yes. I whisper, continuing my ministrations with my hand. Open your mouth. She's already panting, but she opens her mouth farther and I slip the small vibrator inside. It's attached to a chain and can be worn as jewelry if so required. Suck. I'm going to put this inside you. She stills. Suck. I repeat, and remove my hands from her body. She flexes her knees and makes a frustrated grunt. Smiling. I pour more oil onto my palms and finally cup her breasts. Don't stop, I warn, as I gently roll her stiffening nipples between my thumbs and forefingers. They harden and lengthen some more under my touch. You have such beautiful breasts, Anna. She moans, and I gather one of the nipple clamps in one hand. Trailing my lips from her throat toward her breast, I stop and carefully attach a clamp. Her garbled groan is my reward as I bring her trapped nipple to full attention with my lips. She writhes under my touch, shifting from side to side, and I clamp the remaining nipple. Anna's groan is just as loud this time. Feel it, I insist, and I lean back to take in the beautiful sight. Give me this. I remove the vibrator from her mouth and my hand skims down her back toward her backside and between her buttocks. She tenses and rises up on her knees. Hush. Easy, I reassure her and kiss her neck as my fingers continue to stroke between the fine, fine cheeks of her ass. I glide my other hand down the front of her body and start palming her clitoris once more, then ease my fingers into her. I'm going to put this inside you, I murmur. Not here. And my fingers circle her anus, spreading the oil. But here. And I move the fingers of my other hand slowly into and out of her vagina. Ah. She responds. 
Hush now. I stand and slide the vibrator inside her. Capturing her face with my hands, I kiss her, then click the small remote. When the vibrator starts, she gasps and jolts up on her knees. Ah. Easy. I whisper against her lips, stifling her gasp. I tug gently on each of the clamps in turn. She cries out. Christian, please. Hush, baby. Hang in there. You can do this, Anna. She's panting now and dealing with all the stimulation. I'm sure it's intense. Good girl. I soothe her. Christian, she says, and she sounds a little frantic. Hush, feel it, Anna. Don't be afraid. I place my hands on her waist, holding her. I'm right here, baby. I've got this. You've got this. I dip my little finger into the open pot of lube and slowly I move my hands down her back to her ass, watching her reaction, checking that she's okay. I massage her skin and knead her ass, her stunning ass, and I slip one hand between her buttocks. So beautiful. Gently, I push my finger inside her ass so that I feel the vibrator buzzing through her body. She tenses and I move my finger slowly, easing in and out while my teeth graze her chin. So beautiful, Anna. She gasps, then groans and kneels up a little higher, and I know she's close. Her lips start to move, but whatever she's saying, it's soundless. Suddenly she screams as her orgasm strikes. With my free hand I release first one, then the other nipple clamp, and she cries out. I hold her close as her body pulses through her climax, still easing my finger in and out of her. No, she shouts, and I know she's had enough. I remove my finger and the vibrator while keeping her in my arms. She sags against me, but her body is still convulsing. Deftly I unstrap the cuffs on one arm and she falls forward against me. Her head rolling on my shoulder as her intense climax begins to subside. Her legs must be aching. She groans as I lift her and carry her to the bed, where I lay her face up on the satin sheets. Using the remote, I switch off the music, then remove my jeans, freeing my raging erection. I start to rub the back of her legs, her knees, her calves, and then her shoulders, and I remove the cuffs. Lying down beside her, I peel off her mask and find her eyes are scrunched closed. With tenderness I untie her braid, freeing her hair. Leaning forward, I kiss her on the lips. So beautiful, I say. She opens one dazed eye. Hi. I smile down at her. She grunts in response. Rude enough for you. She nods and gives me a sleepy grin. Anna, you never fail. I think you're trying to kill me. Death by orgasm. There are worse ways to go. Like plunging to your death in Charlie Tango. She reaches up and caresses my face and my dispiriting thought disappears. You can kill me like this anytime, she says. Taking her hand, I kiss her knuckles. I'm so proud of her. She never lets me down in here. She cups my face between her hands and kisses me. I stop, pulling back. This is what I want to do, I whisper. From beneath the pillow, I pull out the remote and change the song. I press the button, knowing it will play on repeat, and ease Anna onto her back. The first time ever I saw your face, Roberta Flack's classic fills the room. I want to make love to you, I murmur. My lips seek and find hers, and her fingers entwine in my hair. Please, Anna breathes, and her sensitized body rises to meet mine, opening up for me as I gently ease into her, and we make slow, sweet love. I watch her fall apart in my arms and her climax takes me with her. I let go, pouring myself into her, throwing my head back and calling out her name in wonder. I love you, Anna Steele. I hold her to me. I never want to let her go. My joy is complete. Have I ever been this happy? As I come back to planet Earth, I smooth her hair from her face and look down at the woman I love. She's crying. Hey. I clasp her head in my hands. Did I hurt her? Why are you crying? Because I love you so much, she says, and I close my eyes, letting her words wash over me. And I you, Anna. You make me, whole. I kiss her once more as the music stops, and gather the sheet and wrap it around us both. She looks glorious. Her hair is a mess and her eyes are luminous in spite of her tears. She's so full of life. What do you want to do today? She asks. My day is made, 
Thank you. I kiss her. Mine, too. I love Anna's inner freak. She's never far away. And I think of the plans that I have for her later. I hope they will make her day, too. Well, I should call my head of PR. But frankly, I'd like to remain in this bubble with you. About the crash. I'm playing hooky. It is your birthday, Mr. Gray. You're allowed. And I like having you to myself. She leans up and grazes her teeth against my jaw. She looks happy, and free, if a little tired. I love your music choices. Where do you find them? I'm glad you like them. Sometimes, when I can't sleep I'll either play the piano or trawl iTunes. I don't like to think about you unable to sleep and on your own. It sounds lonely, Anna says, her compassion showing. To be honest, I never felt lonely until you left. I didn't realize how miserable I was. She cups my face. I'm sorry. Don't apologize, Anna. What I did was wrong. She puts her finger over my lips. Hush, she says. I love you just the way you are. That's a song. She laughs and she changes the subject, asking me about work. We've come a long way, Anna says, caressing my face. We have. She looks wistful all of a sudden. What are you thinking about? I ask. The photo shoot that Jose did. Kate, how in command she was. And how hot you looked. Hot. Me. Yeah. Hot. And Kate was all. Sit here. Do this. Do that. Her impersonation of Kavanaugh is spot on. I laugh. To think it could have been her who came to interview me. Thank the Lord for the common cold. I kiss the tip of her nose. I believe she had the flu. Christian, she scolds, and unconsciously trails her fingers through my chest hair. It's weird, but I think she's driven the darkness away. I don't even flinch. All the canes have gone, she says, as she glances around the playroom. I tuck a stray strand of hair behind her ear. I didn't think you'd ever get past that hard limit. No, I don't think I will. She turns and stares at the whips, paddles, and floggers on the wall. You want me to get rid of them, too? I ask. Not the crop. The brown one. Or that suede flogger. She gives me a coy smile. Okay. The crop and the flogger. Why, Miss Steele, you're full of surprises. As are you, Mr. Gray. It's one of the things I love about you. She kisses the corner of my mouth. Suddenly I need to hear this from her, because I still can't quite believe it. What else do you love about me? Her eyes soften with her affection. This, she says, and traces her finger across my lips, tickling them. I love this, and what comes out of it, and what you do to me with it. And what's in here? She strokes the side of my head. You're so smart and witty and knowledgeable, competent in so many things. But most of all, I love what's in here. She presses her palm against my chest. You are the most compassionate man I've ever met. What you do. How you work. It's awe-inspiring. Awe-inspiring. I repeat her last words, not quite believing them but loving them anyway. A slow smile tugs at my mouth, but before I can say anything she launches herself at me. Anna dozes for a few minutes, in my arms. I lie staring up at the ceiling, enjoying her weight on me. Could I be any more content? I don't think so. She wakes when I kiss her forehead. Hungry. I ask. Hum famished. Me, too. She puts her arm on my chest and studies me. It's your birthday, Mr. Gray. I'll cook you something. What would you like? Surprise me. I run my hand down her back. I should check my Blackberry for all the messages I missed yesterday. I sigh when I sit up. I could spend all day with her in here. Let's shower, I say. She grins and together, wrapped in one red sheet, we head down to the bathroom. Once Anna is dressed she takes all the wet clothes from last night out of her sink and heads out the door. Wearing a tiny blue dress, she's all legs. Too much leg. Well at least it's just us. And Taylor. I stop shaving for a moment. Leave them for Mrs. Jones, I call after her. She glances over her shoulder and smiles. Feeling buoyant, I sit down at my desk. Anna is working in the kitchen, and I have a ton of emails and messages to get through. Most are from Sam, annoyed that I've not called him. But there are others, moving messages from my mother, from Mia, 
my dad, and Elliot, all begging me to call. It's painful to hear their concern. And Elena, shit. Anna's hesitant voice is next. Hi. Um, it's me. Anna, are you okay? Call me. Her concern is obvious. My heart constricts as it becomes blindingly clear that I've put her and my family through hell. Gray, you're an idiot. You should have called. I save all the messages bar Alina's and return to the most important voicemail, from the florist in Bellevue. I call them back to outline my requirements, and I'm relieved that they can help me, given such short notice. Then I call my favorite jewelry store. Okay, the only jewelry store I know. I purchased Anna's earrings there, and it looks like they'll be able to help me with the ring. If I were a superstitious man I would say that these are good omens for what's to come. Next, I call Sam. Mr. Gree, where have you been? He's pissed. Tough. Busy. The press has been all over the helicopter story. There are several TV news and print outlets that want an interview. Sam, draw up a statement. Tell them Rose and I are fine. And send it through to me for approval. I'm not interested in doing any interviews. Print, TV, or otherwise. But, Christian, this is a great op. The answer's no. Get me the statement. He's silent for a moment, publicity whore that he is. Yes, Mr. Gree, he says, tight-lipped. I hear, and ignore, his reluctance, but I'm beginning to think I need a new PR person. His credentials were seriously overstated when we checked his references. Thanks, Sam. I hang up. I buzz Taylor on the internal phone system. Good afternoon, Mr. Gree. What news? I'll come down, sir. Taylor tells me that Charlie Tango has been found, and that a recovery crew is on its way with an FAA official and someone from Airbus, Charlie Tango's manufacturer. I hope they'll be able to provide some answers. I'm sure they will, sir, says Taylor. I've emailed you a list of people you should call. Thanks. There's one more thing. I'm going to need you to pop down to this store. I explain what I've discussed with the jeweler. Taylor gives me a broad grin. With pleasure, sir. Will that be all? For now, yes, and thanks. You're most welcome, and happy birthday. He gives me a nod and leaves. I pick up the phone and start making my way through Taylor's list of calls. While I'm on the phone giving a report to the FAA, an email from Anna pops up. From Anastasia Steele. Subject. Lunch. Date. June 18, 2011, 13, 12. 2. Christian Gray. Dear Mr. Gray. I am emailing to inform you that your lunch is nearly ready. And that I had some mind-blowing, kinky fuckery earlier today. Birthday kinky fuckery is to be recommended. And another thing, I love you. A-X. Your fiancé. I'm sure Mrs. Wilson on the other end of the phone at the FAA can hear my smile. With one finger, I type a response. From. Christian Gray. Subject. Kinky fuckery. Date. June 18, 2011, 13, 15. 2. Anastasia Steele. What aspect was most mind-blowing? I'm taking notes. Christian Gray. Famished and wasting away after the morning's exertions CEO, Gray Enterprises Holdings, Inc. P.S. I love your signature. P.P.S. What happened to the art of conversation? I conclude the phone call with Mrs. Wilson and leave my study to find Anna. She's concentrating hard. I tiptoe up to the kitchen counter as she types into her phone. She presses send, looks up, and jumps when she sees me smirking at her. I bound around the kitchen island, pull her into my arms, and kiss her, taking her by surprise once more. That is all, Miss Steele, I say when I release her, and I stroll back into my study feeling ridiculously pleased with myself. Her email is waiting. From. Anastasia Steele. Subject. Famished. Date. June 18, 2011 13 18. 2. Christian Gray. Dear Mr. Gray. May I draw your attention to the first line of my previous email informing you that your lunch is indeed almost ready, so none of this famished and wasting away nonsense. With regard to the mind-blowing aspects of the kinky fuckery, frankly, all of it. I'd be interested in reading your notes.
And I like my bracketed signature, too. A-X. Your fiancé. P.S. Since when have you been so loquacious? And you're on the phone. I call my mom to tell her about the flowers. Darling, how are you? Recovered. It's all over the press. I know. Mom. I'm fine. I have something to tell you. What? I've asked Anna to marry me. She's said yes. My mother is stunned into silence. Mom. Christian. I'm sorry. That's wonderful news, she says, but she sounds a little hesitant. I know this is sudden. Are you sure, darling? Don't get me wrong. I adore Anna. But this is so soon and she's the first girl. Mom. She's not the first girl. She's the first one you've met. Oh. Exactly. Well, I am delighted for you. Congratulations. There's one more thing. What is it, love? I'm having some flowers delivered, for the boathouse. Why? Well, my first proposal was pretty crap. Oh, I see. And, mom, don't tell anyone else. I want it to be a surprise. I plan to make an announcement this evening. As you wish, darling. Mia is in charge of deliveries for the party. Let me find her. I wait for what feels like an eternity. Come on, Mia. Hey, big brother. Thank God you are still with us. What gives? Mom tells me you are coordinating deliveries for my party. How big is this bash, anyway? After your near-death experience, we're celebrating. Oh, hell. Well, I have a delivery coming for the boathouse. Yes. What? From the Bellevue florist. Why? What for? Christ, she can be annoying. I look up and Anna is standing in her short, short dress staring at me. Just let them in and leave them alone. Do you understand, Mia? Anna cocks her head to one side, listening. Okay. Don't get your panties in a wad. I'll send them to the boathouse. Good. Anna mimes eating. Food. Great. I'll see you later, I say to Mia and hang up. One more call. I ask Anna. Sure. That dress is very short. You like it. Anna pirouettes in the doorway and her skirt flares up, providing a tantalizing glimpse of her lacy underwear. You look fantastic in it, Anna. I just don't want anyone else to see you like that. Oh. She looks upset. We're at home, Christian. No one but the staff. I don't want to upset her. I nod as graciously as I can manage and she turns and heads back to the kitchen. Gray. Get a grip. The next call I have to make is to Anna's father. I have no idea what he's going to say when I ask him for his daughter's hand in marriage. From Anna's file, I get Ray's mobile number. Jose said he was fishing. I just hope he's somewhere with a signal. No. He isn't. The call goes to voicemail. Ray Steele. Leave a message. Short and to the point. Hi, Mr. Steele, it's Christian Gray here. I'd like to talk to you about your daughter. Please call me. I give him my number and hang up. What did you expect, Gray? He's in the wilds of the Mount Baker Park. While I have Anna's file on my desk, I decide to deposit some money into her bank account. She'll have to get used to having money. $24,000. $24,000, to the lovely lady in silver, going once, going twice. Sold. I chuckle, remembering her audacity at the auction. I wonder what she'll make of this. I'm sure it will be an interesting discussion. On my computer, I transfer $50,000 to her account. It should show up within the hour. My stomach growls. I'm hungry. But my phone starts ringing. It's Ray. Mr. Steele. Thank you for calling back. Is Annie okay? She's fine. More than fine. She's great. Thank the Lord. What can I do for you, Christian? I know you're fishing. I'm trying. Not catching much today. I'm sorry to hear that. This is more nerve-wracking than I anticipated. My palms are sweating and Mr. Steele says nothing, cranking my anxiety up a notch. Supposing he says no, this is not something I've considered. Mr. Steele. I'm still here, Christian, waiting for you to get to the point. Yes, of course. Um, I called because, um, I'd like your permission to marry your daughter. The words tumble out like I've never negotiated or clinched a deal in my life. What's more, 
they're met with a resounding silence. Mr. Steele. Put my daughter on the line, he says, giving nothing away. Shit. Just a minute. I dart out of my study to where Anna is waiting, and hold out the phone to her. I have Ray for you. Her eyes widen with shock. She takes the phone and covers the mouthpiece. You told him. She squeaks. I nod. She takes a deep breath, and removes her hand from the mouthpiece. Hi, Dad. She listens. She seems calm. What did you say? She asks, and listens again, her eyes on me. Yes. It is sudden. Hang on. She gives me another unreadable look and heads to the other end of the room and out onto the balcony, where she continues her conversation. She starts pacing up and down, but she stays close to the window. And I'm helpless. All I can do is watch her. Her body language gives nothing away. Suddenly, she stops and beams. Her smile could light Seattle. He's either said yes, or no. Hell. Damn it. Gray. Stop with the negative. She says something else. And she looks like she's going to cry. Shit. That's not good. She stomps back and she shoves the phone at me, looking several shades of pissed off. Nervously, I put the phone to my ear. Mr. Steele. Feeling Anna's gaze on my back, I wander into my study just in case it's bad news. Christian, I think you ought to call me Ray. Sounds like my little girl is crazy about you and I'm not one to get in her way. Crazy about you. My heart flips and soars. Well, thank you, sir. You hurt her in any way and I'll kill you. I'd expect nothing less. Crazy kids, he mutters. Now you take good care of her. Annie is my light. She's mine, too, Ray. And good luck with telling her mother. He laughs. Now let me get back to my fishing. I hope you top the 43-pounder. You know about that. Jose told me. He's a talkative guy. Good day, Christian. It is now. I grin. I have your stepfather's rather begrudging blessing, I announced to Anna in the kitchen. She laughs and shakes her head. I think Ray is freaked out, she says. I've got to tell my mom. But I'd like to do that on a full stomach. She waves in the direction of the counter where our food is waiting. Salmon, potatoes, salad, and an interesting dip. She's also selected some wine. A Chablis. Well, this looks great. I open the wine and pour us each a small glass. Damn, you're a good cook, woman. I raise my glass to Anna in appreciation. Her lighthearted expression fades and I'm reminded of the expression on her face outside the playroom this morning. Anna, why did you ask me not to take your photo? Her consternation deepens, worrying me. Anna, what is it? My tone is sharper than I intended and she jumps. I found your photos, she says, as if she's committed some terrible sin. What photos? But as I say the words, I realize exactly what she's talking about. And I feel like I'm back in my father's study, waiting for a pompous dressing down for some infraction I've committed. You've been in the safe. How the hell did she do that? Safe. No. I didn't know you had a safe. I don't understand. In your closet. The box. I was looking for your tie, and the box was under your jeans. The ones you normally wear in the playroom, except today. Fuck. No one should see those photographs. Especially Anna. How did they get there? Layla. It's not what you think. I'd forgotten all about them. That box had been moved. Those photographs belong in my safe. Who moved them? Anna asks. There's only one person who could have done that. Oh. Who? And what do you mean it's not what I think? Confess. Gray. You've already alluded to the depths of your depravity. This is it, baby. Fifty shades. This is going to sound cold, but, they're an insurance policy. Insurance policy. Against exposure. I watch her face as she realizes what I mean. Oh. She closes her eyes as if she's trying to erase what I've told her. Yes. You're right. She says quietly. That does sound cold. She stands and starts to clear the dishes. It's to avoid me. Anna. Do they know? The girls. The subs. Of course they know. Before she can escape to the sink, I fold her into my arms. Those photos are supposed to be in the safe. They're not for recreational use. 
They were once upon a time, gray. Maybe they were when they were taken originally. But, they don't mean anything. Who put them in your closet? It could only have been Layla. She knows your safe combination. I guess. It wouldn't surprise me. It's a very long combination, and I use it so rarely. It's the one number I have written down and haven't changed. I wonder what else she knows and if she's taken anything else out of there. I'll check it. Look, I'll destroy the photos. Now, if you like. They're your photos, Christian. Do with them as you wish. And I know she's offended and hurt. Christ. Anna. This was all before you. I take her head in my hands. Don't be like that. I don't want that life. I want our life, together. I know she struggles with not being enough for me. Maybe she thinks I want to do those things to her and photograph her. Gray, be honest, of course you would. But I'd never do it without her permission. I had all my submissives consent to having their photographs taken. Anna's wounded expression reveals her vulnerability. I thought we'd moved on. I want her as she is. She's more than enough. Anna, I thought we exorcised all those ghosts this morning. I feel that way, don't you? Her eyes soften. Yes. Yes, I feel like that, too. Good. I kiss her and hold her, feeling her body relax against mine. I'll shred them. And then I have to go to work. I'm sorry, baby, but I have a mountain of business to get through this afternoon. It's cool. I have to call my mother, she says, and makes a face. Then I want to do some shopping and bake you a cake. A cake. She nods. A chocolate cake. You want a chocolate cake. I grin. I'll see what I can do, Mr. Gree. I kiss her once more. I don't deserve her. I hope, one day, I'll prove that I do. Anna was right. The photographs are in my closet. I will have to ask Dr. Flynn to find out if Layla moved them. When I walk back into the living room, Anna's not there. I suspect she's calling her mother. There's a certain irony in sitting at my desk and shredding these photographs. Relics of my old life. The first photograph is of Susanna, bound and gagged, on her knees on the wooden floor. It's not a bad photograph, and briefly I wonder what Jose would make of this subject matter. The thought amuses me, but I put the first few photographs through the shredder. I turn the rest of the pile over so I can't see the images and within 12 minutes they're all gone. You still have the negatives. Gray. Stop. I'm relieved to find that nothing else is missing from the safe. I turn to my computer and make a start in my emails. My first task is to rewrite Sam's pretentious statement about my crash landing. I edit it, it lacks clarity and detail, and I send it back to him. Then I scroll through my text messages. Elena. Christian. Please call me. I need to hear it from your lips that you're okay. Elena's text must have come through while I was having lunch. The rest are from late last night and yesterday. Rose. My feet are sore. But all good. Hope you are good, too. Sam Publicity VP. I really need to talk to you. Sam Publicity VP. Mr. Gree. Call me. Urgently. Sam Publicity VP. Mr. Gree. Glad you are okay. Please call me ASAP. Elena. Thank God you're okay. I just saw the news. Please call me. Elliot. Pick up the phone. Bro. We're worried. Here. Grace. Where are you? Call me. I'm worried. So is your father. Nia. Christian. WTF. Call US. Anna. We're at the Bunker Club. Please join us. You've been mighty quiet Mr. Gree. Miss you. Elena. Are you ignoring me? Fuck. Just leave me alone, Elena. Taylor. Sir, false alarm with my daughter. On my way back to Seattle. Should be there 3 p.m. I delete them all. I know I'm going to have to deal with Elena at some point, but I don't feel like it now. I open a spreadsheet from Fred with the cost projections for the Kavanaugh contract. The smell of baking drifts into my study. The aroma is mouth-watering and evokes one of the few happy memories I have of my early childhood. It's a bittersweet feeling. The crack whore. Baking. A movement distracts me from my thoughts and the spreadsheet I'm reading. It's Anna, 
Standing in my study doorway. I'm just heading to the store to pick up some ingredients, she says. Okay. Not dressed like that, surely. What? You going to put some jeans on or something? Christian. They're just legs, she says dismissively, and I grit my teeth. What if we were at the beach? She says. We're not at the beach. Would you object if we were at the beach? We'd be on a private beach. No. I respond. She gives me a wicked smile. Well, just imagine we are. Laters. She turns and bolts. What? She's running. And before I know it, I'm out of my seat and going after her. I see a flash of turquoise exit through the main entrance at speed and I pursue her into the foyer, but she's in the elevator and the doors are closing when I catch up with her. She gives me a wave from inside and then she's gone. Her haste is such an overreaction, I want to laugh. What did she think I'd do? Shaking my head, I walk back to the kitchen. The last time we played tag, she left me. The thought is sobering. I stand at the fridge and pour myself some water and I spy my cake cooling on a wire rack. I bend to sniff it and my mouth waters. I close my eyes and a memory of the crack whore resurfaces. Mommy is home. Mommy is here. She's wearing her biggest shoes and a short, short skirt. It's red. And shiny. Mommy has purple marks on her legs. Near her butt. She smells good. Like candy. Come in. Big guy, make yourself comfortable. She's with a man. A big man with a big beard. I don't know him. Not now. Maggot. Mommy has company. Go play in your room with your cars. I'll bake you a cake when I'm done. She closes her bedroom door. I hear a ping of the elevator and I turn around expecting Anna to walk back in, but it's Taylor with two men, one holding a briefcase, the other as broad as he is tall, carrying himself like hired muscle. Mr. Gree. Taylor introduces the younger, smarter man, who's carrying the briefcase. This is Louis Astoria, from Astoria Fine Jewelry. Ah, thank you for coming. My pleasure, Mr. Gree. He's animated. His ebony eyes are warm and friendly. I have some fine pieces to show you. Excellent. Let's look at these in my study. If you'd like to follow me. I know immediately which platinum ring I want. It's not the biggest. It's not the smallest. It's the finest and most elegant ring, with a four-carat diamond of the highest quality, grade D, and internally flawless clarity. It's beautiful, oval in shape, in a simple setting. The others are too fussy or too gaudy, not right for my girl. You've made a fine choice, Mr. Gree, he says, as he pockets my check. I'm sure your fiancé will love it. And we can get it resized if necessary. Thank you again for coming. Taylor will see you out. Thank you, Mr. Gree. He hands me the ring box and leaves my study with Taylor. I take one more look at the ring. I really hope she likes it. I place it in my desk drawer and sit down. I wonder if I should call Anna, just to say hi, but dismiss the idea. Instead I listen to her message once more. Hi. Um, it's me. Anna, are you okay? Call me. Just hearing her voice is enough. I return to my work. While I'm on the phone with the Airbus engineer, I stare out of the window at the sky. It's the same blue as Anna's eyes. And the Eurocopter specialist is due Monday afternoon. He's flying from Marseille, Provence near our headquarters in Marignane, to Paris, then to Seattle. It's the earliest we can get him there. We're fortunate that our base in the Pacific Northwest is at Boeing Field. Good. Just keep me informed. We'll have our people all over the aircraft as soon as she arrives here. Tell them that I'll need their initial findings either Monday evening or Tuesday morning. Will do, Mr. Gree. I hang up and turn back to my desk. Anna is standing in the doorway, watching me, looking pensive and a little worried. Hi, she says, and she enters my study and walks around my desk until she's standing in front of me. I want to ask her why she ran, but she preempts me. I'm back. Are you mad at me? I sigh and lift her into my lap. Yes, I whisper. You ran from me, and the last time you did that, you left me. I'm sorry. I don't know what came over me. She curls into me, and rests her hand and her head against my chest. Her weight is a comfort. Me, neither. 
Wear what you like. I place my hand on her knee just to reassure her, but as soon as I touch her, I want more. My desire is like an electric current through my body. It jolts me awake and makes me feel alive. I run my hand up her thigh. Besides, this dress has its advantages. She looks up, her eyes smoky, and I bend to kiss her. Our lips touch, and my tongue teases hers and my libido lights up like a solar flare. I feel it in her, too. She grabs my head between her hands, as her tongue wrestles with mine. I groan as my body responds, growing hard. Wanting her. Needing her. I nip her lower lip, her throat, her ear. She moans into my mouth and yanks my hair. Anna. I unzip my pants and free my erection, and pull her astride me. Stretching her lacy underwear to the side and out of the way, I sink into her. Her hands grip the back of my chair, the creak of the leather giving her away. She stares down at me and begins to move. Up and down. Fast. Her rhythm is quick and frenetic. There's a desperation in her movements, as if she wants to make amends. Slow. Baby. Slow. I put my hands on her hips and slow her down. Easy. Anna. I want to savor you. I capture her mouth and she moves at a gentler pace. But her passion is in her kiss and in her touch as she tugs my head back. Oh. Baby. She moves faster. And faster still. This is what she wants. She's building. I feel it. Climbing higher and higher as she moves. Faster and faster. Ah. She falls apart in my arms and she takes me with her. I like your version of sorry, I whisper. And I like yours. She nuzzles my chest. Have you finished? Christ, Anna, you want more? No. Your work. I'll be done in about half an hour. I kiss her hair. I heard your message on my voicemail. From yesterday. You sounded worried. She hugs me. I was. It's not like you not to respond. I kiss her once more and we sit in quiet, peaceful togetherness. I hope she always sits in my lap like this. She fits perfectly. Finally, she shifts. Your cake should be ready in half an hour, she says as she stands. Looking forward to it. It smelled delicious, evocative even, while it was baking. She leans down and plants a tender kiss at the edge of my mouth. I watch her sachet out of my study as I zip up my jeans and I feel, lighter. I turn and look at the view from the window. It's late afternoon and the sun is shining, although it's beginning to dip toward the sound. There are shadows on the streets below. Down there it's already dusk, but up here the light is still golden. Maybe that's why I live here. To be in the light. I've been striving for it since I was a small boy. And it's taken an extraordinary young woman to make me realize that. Anna is my guiding light. I'm her lost boy, now found. Anna is standing with a frosted chocolate cake that's adorned with a solitary flickering candle. She sings, Happy Birthday, to me in her sweet musical voice, and I realize I've never heard her sing. It's magical. I blow out the candle, closing my eyes to make my wish. I wish that Anna will always love me, and never leave me. I've made my wish, I inform her. The frosting is still soft. I hope you like it. I can't wait to taste it, Anastasia. She cuts us each a slice and hands me a plate and a fork. Here goes. It's heavenly. The frosting is sweet, the cake moist, and the filling, um. This is why I want to marry you. She giggles, relieved, I think, and watches me devour the rest of my cake. Anna is quiet in the car on the way to my parents' place in Bellevue. She stares out of the window but gives me an occasional glance. She looks sensational in emerald green. There's little traffic tonight, and the R8 roars along the 520 bridge. About halfway across, Anna turns to me. There was an additional $50,000 in my bank account this afternoon. And? You don't. Anna, you're going to be my wife. Please, let's not fight about this. She takes a deep breath and is silent for a while as we cruise just above the pink and dusky waters of Lake Washington. Okay. She says. Thank you. You're most welcome. I breathe a sigh of relief. See, that wasn't so hard, was it Anna? On Monday, I'll take care of your student loans. Ready to face my family. I switch off the R8 ignition.
were parked in my parents' driveway. Yes. Are you going to tell them? Of course. I'm looking forward to seeing their reactions. I'm excited. I step out of the car and open her door. It's a little cool this evening and she pulls her wrap around her shoulders. I take her hand and we head to the front door. The driveway is choked with cars, including Elliot's truck. It's a bigger party than I had anticipated. Carrick opens the front door before I can knock. Christian. Hello. Happy birthday. Son. He takes my hand and engulfs me in a surprise hug. This never happens. Um. Thanks. Dad. Anna. How lovely to see you again. He gives Anna a quick affectionate embrace and we follow him into the house. There's a loud clatter of heels, and I expect to see Mia running down the hallway, but it's Catherine Kavanaugh. She looks mad. You too. I want to talk to you, she gripes. Anna gives me a blank look and I shrug. I have no idea what Kavanaugh's beef is but we follow her into the empty dining room. She shuts the door and turns on Anna. What the fuck is this? She hisses and waves a piece of paper at her. Anna takes it from her and reads it. Almost immediately she blanches and her startled eyes meet mine. What the hell? Anna steps between me and Catherine. What is it? I ask, feeling anxious. Anna ignores me and addresses Kavanaugh. Kate, this has nothing to do with you. Catherine is surprised by her reaction. What the fuck are they talking about? Anna, what is it? Christian, would you just go, please? No, show me. I hold out my hand and reluctantly she passes the piece of paper to me. It's her email response to the contract. Shit. What's he done to you? Catherine asks, ignoring me. That's none of your business, Kate. Anna sounds exasperated. Where did you get this? I ask. Kavanaugh blushes. That's irrelevant. But I stare at her and she continues. It was in the pocket of a jacket, which I assume is yours, that I found on the back of Anna's bedroom door. She scowls at me, ready for battle. Have you told anyone? I ask. No, of course not. She snaps, and has the gall to look offended. Good. I walk over to the fireplace and taking a lighter from the small porcelain bowl on the mantelpiece one set fire to the corner of the printout and let it float, burning, into the grate. Both women are silent, watching me. Once it's reduced to ashes, I turn my attention back to them. Not even Elliot, Anna asks. No one, Catherine says, and she sounds emphatic. She looks a little puzzled and maybe hurt. I just want to know you're okay, Anna, she says, concerned. Unseen by them both, I roll my eyes. I'm fine, Kate, more than fine. Please, Christian and I are good, really good, this is old news. Please ignore it, Anna pleads with her. Ignore it, she says. How can I ignore that? What's he done to you? He hasn't done anything to me, Kate. Honestly. I'm good. Really? She asks. For fuck's sake. I wrap my arm around Anna and stare at Catherine, trying and probably failing to keep the animosity out of my expression. Anna has consented to be my wife, Catherine. Wife. She exclaims, her eyes widening in disbelief. We're getting married. We're going to announce our engagement this evening, I inform her. Oh. Catherine stares at Anna, stunned. I leave you alone for 16 days, and this happens. It's very sudden. So yesterday, when I said, she stops. Where does that email fit into all this? It doesn't. Kate, forget it, please. I love him and he loves me. Don't do this. Don't ruin his party in our night, Anna begs. Catherine's eyes fill with tears. Shit. She's going to cry. No. Of course I won't. You're okay. I've never been happier. Anna whispers, and my heart quickens. Catherine grabs her hand, even though I still have my arm wrapped around Anna. You really are okay, she asks, her voice full of hope. Yes, Anna sounds happier and she shrugs out of my hold to hug her. Oh, Anna, I was so worried when I read this. I didn't know what to think. Will you explain it to me? She asks. One day, not now. Good. I won't tell anyone. I love you so much, Anna, like my own sister. I just thought. She shakes her head. I didn't know what to think. I'm sorry. If you're happy, 
Then I'm happy. Catherine looks at me. I'm sorry. I don't mean to intrude. I give her a nod. Maybe she does care about Anna, but how Elliot puts up with her I'll never know. I really am sorry. You're right. It's none of my business, she whispers to Anna. There's a knock that startles us all, and my mom pokes her head around the door. Everything okay? Darling, mom asks, looking directly at me. Everything's fine, Mrs. Gree, Catherine offers. Fine, mom, I respond. She expresses her relief as she enters the room. Then you won't mind if I give my son a birthday hug. She gives us all a broad smile and walks into my waiting arms. I hold her close. Happy birthday. Darling, she says. I'm so glad you're still with us. Mom, I'm fine. I look into her warm hazel eyes and they're shining with maternal love. I'm so happy for you, she says, and she holds her palm against my cheek. Mom, I love you. She steps out of my embrace. Well, kids, if you've all finished your tete-a-tete, -tete, there's a throng of people here to check that you really are in one piece, Christian, and to wish you a happy birthday. I'll be right there. Mom looks from Catherine to Anna, satisfied, I think, that nothing is amiss. She winks at Anna as she holds open the door for all of us. Anna takes my hand. Christian, I really do apologize, Catherine says. I acknowledge her with the briefest of nods and we walk into the hallway. Does your mother know about us? Asks Anna. Yes. Anna raises her eyebrows. Oh, well, that was an interesting start to the evening. As ever, Miss Steele, you have a gift for understatement. I kiss her knuckles and we step into the living room. A deafening, spontaneous round of applause erupts as we enter. Shit. So many people. Why so many people? My family. Cabana's brother. Flynn and his wife. Mac. Bastille. Mia's friend Lily and her mother. Rose and Gwen. Elena. Elena catches my attention with a little salute while she applauds. I'm distracted by my mom's housekeeper. She's carrying a tray of champagne. I squeeze Anna's hand and let it go as the applause dies down. Thank you, everyone. Looks like I'll need one of these. I take two flutes, and hand a glass to Anna. I raise my glass in tribute to the room. Everyone moves forward, overzealous and eager to greet me because of yesterday's accident. Elena is first to reach us, and I take Anna's free hand. Christian, I was so worried. Elena kisses me on both cheeks before I have a chance to react. Anna tries to free her hand but I tighten my hold on her. I'm good, Elena, I respond. Why didn't you call me? She sounds aggravated, her eyes searching mine. I've been busy. Didn't you get my messages? I let go of Anna's hand and put my arm around her shoulder, instead pulling her to me. Elena gives Anna a smile. Anna, she purrs. You look lovely, dear. Elena, thank you. Anna's tone is saccharine and insincere. Could this be any more awkward? I catch mom's eye and she frowns, looking at the three of us. Elena, I need to make an announcement, I tell her. Of course, she says, with a brittle smile. I ignore her. Everyone, I call out, and I wait for the hum in the room to die down. When I have everyone's attention, I take a deep breath. Thank you for coming today. I have to say I was expecting a quiet family dinner, so this is a pleasant surprise. I shoot Mia a pointed look and she waves at me. Rose and I, I give Rose and Gwen a nod, we had a close call yesterday. Rose raises her glass to me. So, I'm especially glad to be here today to share with all of you my very good news. This beautiful woman, I look down at my girl beside me, Miss Anastasia Rose Steele, has consented to be my wife and I'd like you all to be the first to know. My announcement is met with a few gasps, a cheer, and another spontaneous round of applause. I turn to Anna, who looks flushed and beautiful, tip her chin up and give her a swift, chaste kiss. You'll soon be mine. I am all ready. Legally, I mouth at her, with a wicked grin. She chuckles. Mom and Dad are the first to congratulate us. Darling boy, I've never seen you this happy. Mom kisses my cheek and wipes a tear and then gushes over Anna. Son, I'm so proud, Carrick says. Thanks, Dad. She's a lovely girl, I know. 
Where is the ring? exclaims Mia as she hugs Anna. Anna gives me a startled look. We're going to choose one together. I glare at my little sister. She's such a pain in the ass sometimes. Oh, don't look at me like that, Gray. Mia scoffs, and she folds her arms around me. I'm so thrilled for you, Christian, she says. When will you get married? Have you set a date? No idea, and no we haven't. Anna and I need to discuss all that. I hope you have a big wedding here. Her persistence is overwhelming. We'll probably fly to Vegas tomorrow. She looks pissed, but thankfully I'm saved by Elliot, who gives me bear hug. Way to go, bro. He slaps me on the back, hard. Elliot turns to Anna and Bastille claps me on my back, too. Harder. Well, Gray, I did not see this coming. Congratulations, man. He pumps my hand. Thank you, Claude. So, when will I start training your fiancé? The thought of her kicking you onto your backside fills me with hope and joy. I laugh. I've given her your schedule. I'm sure she'll be in touch. Lily's mother, Ashley, congratulates me, but she's a little frosty. I hope she and Lily steer clear of my fiancé. I rescue Anna from Mia as Dr. Flynn and his wife approach. Christian, says Flynn, holding out his hand, and we shake. John, Rion, I give his wife a kiss. Glad you're still with us, Christian, Flynn says. My life would be most dull, and penurious, without you. John, Rion scolds him, and I introduce her to Anastasia. Delighted to meet the woman who has finally captured Christian's heart, Rion says warmly to Anna. Thank you, she replies. That was one googly you bold there, Christian. Flynn shakes his head in amused disbelief. What? John, you and your cricket metaphors. Rion scolds him again, wishes me a happy birthday and congratulates us, and soon she and Anna are deep in an animated conversation. That was quite the announcement, given your audience, John says, and I know he's referring to Elena. Yes, I'm sure she wasn't expecting that, I answer. We can talk about it later. How's Layla? She's good, Christian, responding well to treatment. Another couple of weeks and we can consider an outpatient program. That's a relief. She's interested in our art therapy classes. Really? She used to paint. So she said, I think these classes could really help. Great. Is she eating? Yes. Her appetite's fine. Good. Ask her something for me. Of course. I need to know if she moved some photography I had in my safe. Ah. Yes. She told me about that. She did. You know how mischievous she can be. Her intention was to rattle Anna. Well, it worked. We can discuss that later, too. We're joined by Rose and Gwen, whom I introduced to Anna. I'm so glad to finally meet you, Anna, says Rose. Thank you. Have you recovered from your ordeal? Rose nods and Gwen puts her arm around her. It was quite something, Rose continues. How Christian managed to land safely was a miracle. He's an excellent pilot. It was luck, and I wanted to get home to my girl, I respond. Of course you did, and having met her, who can blame you? Says Gwen. Grace announces that dinner is served in the kitchen. Taking Anna's hand, I give it a quick squeeze to see how she's holding up, and we follow the guests through to the kitchen. Mia ambushes Anna in the hallway, holding two cocktail glasses, and I know she's up to no good. Anna gives me a brief panic look but I let her go, watching as they enter the dining room. Mia closes the door behind them. In the kitchen, Mac approaches me to offer his congratulations. Please, Mac, call me Christian. You're at my engagement party. Heard about the crash. He listens intently as I give him the grisly details. My mother has set out a feast with a Moroccan theme. I load a plate while Mac and I shoot the breeze about the grace. As I help myself to a second portion of lamb tagine, I wonder what the hell Anna and Mia are doing. I decide to go and rescue Anna but outside the dining room, I hear her shouting. Don't you dare tell me what I'm getting myself into. Shit. What gives? When will you learn? It's none of your goddamned business. Anna rages. I try to open the door, but someone is in the way. The person moves and the door swings open. 
Anna is bristling with anger. Her complexion reddening. She's shaking with fury. Elena stands before her, drenched in what must have been Anna's drink. I shut the door and stand between them. What the fuck are you doing, Elena? I snarl. I told you to leave her alone. She wipes her face with the back of her hand. She's not right for you, Christian. What? I yell and I'm so loud that I'm sure I've startled Anna because Elena jumps, too. But I don't give a fuck. I've warned her. And warned her. How the fuck do you know what's right for me? You have needs, Christian, she says, her voice softer, and I know she's trying to placate me. I've told you before, this is none of your fucking business. I'm surprised by my own vehemence. What is this? I scowl at her. Do you think it's you? You. You think you're right for me. Alina's expression hardens, her eyes like flint. She stands taller and steps toward me. I was the best thing that ever happened to you, she hisses, with unrestrained arrogance. Look at you now. One of the richest, most successful entrepreneurs in the United States. Controlled. Driven. You need nothing. You are master of your universe. She's going there. Fuck. I step back. Disgusted. You loved it, Christian, don't try and kid yourself. You were on the road to self-destruction, and I saved you from that, saved you from a life behind bars. Believe me, baby, that's where you would have ended up. I taught you everything you know, everything you need. I cannot remember a time when I've felt such rage. You taught me how to fuck, Elena. But it's empty, like you. No wonder Link left. She gasps, shocked. You never once held me. You never once said you loved me. Her ice blue eyes narrow. Love is for fools, Christian. Get out of my house, Grace commands in a cold fury. The three of us jump and turn to see my mother, an avenging angel, standing on the threshold of the room. She fixates on Elena, and if looks could kill, Elena would be a small mound of ash on the floor. I look from Grace to Elena, her color now drained from her face. And as Grace stalks toward her, Elena seems powerless to move or say anything while under my mother's withering glare. Grace slaps her heart across her face, astonishing us all. The sound resonates off the walls. Take your filthy paws off my son, you whore, and get out of my house, now. Grace seethes through gritted teeth. Fuck. Mom. Elena clutches her cheek in shock. She blinks rapidly, staring at Grace then turns and abruptly leaves the room, not bothering to close the door behind her. Mom turns to me, and I cannot look away. I see hurt and anguish written all over her face. She says nothing as we stare at each other, and an oppressive and unbearable silence fills the room. Finally she speaks. Anna, before I hand him over to you, would you mind giving me a minute or two alone with my son? It's not a request. Of course, Anna whispers. I watch Anna leave and close the door. Mom glowers at me, saying nothing, looking at me as though she's seeing me for the first time. Seeing the monster she reared but did not create. Shit. I'm in big trouble. My scalp prickles in acknowledgement and I feel the blood drain from my face. How long, Christian, she says, her voice low. And I know that tone, it's the calm before the storm. How much did she hear? A few years, I mumble. I don't want her to know. I don't want to tell her. I don't want to hurt her and I know it will. I've known that since I was 15. How old were you? I swallow and my heart rate accelerates like a Formula One engine. I have to be careful here. I don't want to cause trouble for Elena. I study mom's face, trying to judge how she'll react. Should I lie to her? Could I lie to her? And part of me knows I lied to her every time I saw Elena and told her I was studying with a friend. Mom's eyes are piercing. Tell me, how old were you when this all started? She says through clenched teeth. It's the voice that I've only heard on rare occasions, and I know I'm doomed. She will not stop until she has an answer. Sixteen, I whisper. She narrows her eyes and cocks her head to one side. Try again. Her voice is chillingly quiet. Hell. How does she know? Christian, she warns, prompting me. Fifteen. She closes her eyes like I've stabbed her, her hand flying to her mouth as she stifles a sob. When she opens them, 
They're filled with pain and unshed tears. Mom, I try to think of something to say to take that pain away. I step toward her and she holds up her hand to stop me. Christian, I am so mad at you right now. I suggest you don't come any closer. How did you know that I lied? I ask. For heaven's sake, Christian, I'm your mother. She snaps and dashes a fallen tear from her cheek. I feel myself blushing, feeling stupid and slightly piqued at the same time. Only my mom can make me feel this way. My mom. And Anna. I thought I was a better liar. Yes, you should look shamefaced. How long did this go on for? How long did you lie to us, Christian? I shrug. I don't want her to know. Tell me. She insists. A few years. 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 She shouts, making me cringe. She so rarely shouts. I can't believe it. That fucking woman. I gasp. I have never heard Grace swear. Ever. It shocks me. She turns and paces to the window. I stay standing. Paralyzed. Speechless. Mom just cursed. And to think, all the times she's been here. Grace groans and puts her head in her hands. I cannot stand by any longer. I step toward her and wrap my arms around her. This is so new to me, holding my mom. I pull her to my chest, and she starts to weep quietly. I've already thought you dead this week, and now this, she sobs. Mom, it's not what you think. Don't even try it, Christian. I heard you, I heard what you said. That she taught you to fuck. She's said it again. I flinch. This isn't her. She doesn't swear. It's mortifying to think I have something to do with this. The thought of hurting Grace is excruciating. I'd never want to hurt her. She saved me. And all at once I'm overwhelmed by my shame and my remorse. I knew something happened when you were 15. She was the reason, wasn't she? The reason you suddenly calmed down, seemed to focus. Oh, Christian, what did she do to you? Mom, why is she overreacting? Do I tell her that Elena brought me under control? I don't have to tell her how. Yes, I murmur. She groans again. Oh, Christian, I've gotten drunk with that woman, spilled my soul to her so many nights. And to think, my relationship with her has nothing to do with your friendship. Don't give me that bullshit, Christian. She abused my trust. She abused my son. Her voice cracks, and once more she buries her face in her hands. Mom, it didn't feel like that. She stands back and swats me around the head, making me duck. Words fail me, Christian. Fail me. Where did I go wrong? Mom, this is not your fault. How? How did it start? She holds her hand up and continues hurriedly. I don't want to know that. What will your father say? Fuck. Carrick will go batshit. Suddenly I'm 15 again, dreading another of his interminable lectures on personal responsibility and acceptable behavior. Christ, that's the last thing I want. Yes, he'll be mad as hell, mom interjects, correctly interpreting my expression. We knew something had happened. You changed overnight, and to think it was because you got laid by my best friend. Right now, I want the floor to swallow me up. Mom, it's been, it's done, it's gone. She did me no harm. Christian, I heard what you said. I heard her cold response. And to think, she puts her head in her hands once more. Suddenly her eyes fly up to meet mine, and widen in horror. Fuck. What now? No. She breathes. What? Oh no. Tell me it's not true, because if it is, I'll find your father's old pistol and I'll shoot the bitch. Mom. What? I know that Alina's tastes run to the exotic, Christian. For the second time this evening, I feel slightly dizzy. Shit. She must not know this. It was just sex. Mom, I mutter quickly. Let's shut that down right now. No way am I exposing my mother to that part of my life. She narrows her eyes at me. I don't want the sordid details, Christian. Because that's what this is. Nasty, sordid, squalid. What kind of woman does that to a 15-year-old boy? It's disgusting. To think of all the confidences I've shared with her. Well, you can be sure she'll never set foot in this house again. She presses her lips together in determination. And you should cease all contact with her. Mom, 
Um, Elena and I run a very successful business together. No, Christian. You cut your ties with her. I stare at her, speechless. How can she tell me what to do? I'm 28 years old, for fuck's sake. Mom. No, Christian, I'm serious. If you don't, I will go to the police. I pale. You wouldn't. I will. I couldn't stop it then, but I can now. You're just real mad, mom, and I don't blame you, but you're overreacting. Don't tell me I'm overreacting, she yells. You are not going to have any kind of relationship with someone who can abuse a troubled, immature child. She should come with a health warning. She's glowering at me. Okay. I hold my hands up defensively and she seems to compose herself. Does Anna know? Yes, she does. Good. You shouldn't start your married life with secrets. She frowns as if she's speaking from personal experience. Vaguely, I wonder what that's about, but she recovers herself. I'd be interested to hear what she thinks of Elena. She's kind of in your camp. Sensible girl. You've fallen on your feet with her, at least. A lovely young woman who's the right age. Someone you can find happiness with. My expression softens. Yes. She makes me happier than I ever thought possible. You are to end it with Elena. Cut all ties. You understand? Yes, mom. I could do that as a wedding present to Anastasia. What? Are you crazy? You'd better think of something else. That's hardly romantic. Christian, she scolds. I thought she'd like that. Honestly, men, you have no idea sometimes. What do you think I should give her? Oh, Christian, she sighs, then offers me a small wan smile. You really haven't taken in a word, have you? Do you know why I'm upset? Yes, of course. Tell me, then. I gaze at her and sigh. I don't know, mom. Because you didn't know. Because she's your friend. She reaches up and gently strokes my hair, like she used to when I was small. The only place she would touch me, because it was the only place I let her. For all those reasons and because she abused you, darling. And you are so deserving of love. You're so easy to love. You always have been. There's a burning sensation at the back of my eyes. Mom, I whisper. She puts her arms around me, calmer now, and I hug her in return. You'd better go find your bride-to-be. I'm going to have to tell your father when the party's over. No doubt he'll want to talk to you, too. Mom. Please. Do you have to tell him? Yes, Christian, I do. And I hope he gives you hell. Fuck. I'm still mad at you. But madder at her. Her face loses all trace of humor. I'd never realized how scary Grace could be. I know, I murmur. Go on, off you go. Find your girl. She releases me, steps back, and rubs her fingers under her eyes to wipe away her smudged makeup. She looks beautiful. This wonderful woman, who truly loves me, like I love her. I take a deep breath. I didn't mean to hurt you, mom. I know. Go. I lean down and gently kiss her forehead, surprising her. I walk out of the room to find Anna. Shit. That was heavy. Anna's not in the kitchen. Hey, bro, want a beer? Elliot asks. In a minute, I'm looking for Anna. She come to her senses and run off. Fuck off, Lelliot. She's not in the sitting room. She wouldn't leave, would she? My room. I vault up the first flight of stairs, then up the second. She's standing on the landing. I reach the top step and stop when we are eye to eye. Hi. Hi, she answers. I was worried. I know, she interrupts me. I'm sorry, I couldn't face the festivities. I just had to get away, you know. To think, she caresses my face and I lean my cheek into her touch. And you thought you'd do that in my room? Yes. Stepping up beside her, I reach out to her and we hold each other. She smells amazing. Soothing, even. I'm sorry you had to endure all that. It's not your fault, Christian. Why was she here? She's a family friend. Not anymore. How's your mom? Mom is pretty fucking mad at me right now. I'm really glad you're here, and that we're in the middle of a party. Otherwise I might be breathing my last. That bad, huh? Complete overreaction. Can you blame her? Anna asks. 
I consider this for a moment. Her best friend fucking her son. No. Can we sit? Sure. Here. Anna nods and we both sit down at the top of the stairs. So, how do you feel? She asks. I let out a deep breath. I feel liberated. I shrug and it's true. It's like a weight has been lifted. No more worrying about what Elena thinks. Really. Our business relationship is over. Done. Will you liquidate the salon business? I'm not that vindictive, Anastasia. No. I'll gift them to her. I'll talk to my lawyer Monday. I owe her that much. She gives me a quizzical look. No more Mrs. Robinson. Gone. Anna grins. I'm sorry you lost a friend. Are you? No. She says, sardonically. Come. I stand and offer her my hand. Let's join the party in our honor. I might even get drunk. Do you get drunk? Not since I was a wild teenager. We walk down the stairs. Have you eaten? Anna looks guilty. No. Well, you should. From the look and smell of Elena, that was one of my father's lethal cocktails you threw on her. Christian. I. I hold up my hand. No arguing, Anastasia. If you're going to drink and toss alcohol on my exes, you need to eat. It's rule number one. I believe we've already had that discussion after our first night together. An image of her lying comatose in my bed at the Heathman comes to mind. We stop in the hallway and I caress her face, my fingers skimming her jaw. I lay awake for hours and watched you sleep, I whisper. I might have loved you even then. Leaning down I kiss her, and she melts against me. Eat. I motion toward the kitchen. Okay. She says. I close the door, having bid farewell to Dr. Flynn and his wife. Finally. I can be alone with Anna. It's just the family left. Grace has had too much to drink and is in the den, murdering, I will survive, on the karaoke machine with Mia and Catherine. Do you blame her? Anna asks. I narrow my eyes. Are you smirking at me, Miss Steele? I am. It's been quite a day. Christian, recently, every day with you has been quite a day. Fair point well made, Miss Steele. Come, I want to show you something. I lead her through the hall into the kitchen. Carrick, Elliot, and Ethan Cavanaugh are arguing about the Mariners. Off for a stroll, Elliot taunts us as we head to the French doors, but I give him the finger and otherwise ignore him. Outside, it's a mild night. I usher Anna up the stone steps to the lawn, where she takes off her shoes and pauses for a moment to admire the view. The half moon is high above the bay, illuminating a bright silvery path across the water. Seattle is lit up and twinkling as a backdrop. We walk, hand in hand, toward the boathouse. It's lit inside and out and the beckoning light is our guide. Christian, I'd like to go to church tomorrow, Anna says. Oh. When was the last time I was in church? I recall her background information. I don't remember her being religious. I prayed you'd come back alive and you did. It's the least I could do. Okay. Maybe I'll go with her. Where are you going to put the photos Jose took of me? I thought we might put them in the new house. You bought it. I stop. Yes. I thought you liked it. I do. When did you buy it? Yesterday morning. Now we need to decide what to do with it. Don't knock it down. Please. It's such a lovely house. It just needs some tender loving care. Okay. I'll talk to Elliot. He knows a good architect. She did some work on my place in Aspen. He can do the remodeling. Anna smiles, then chuckles with amusement. What? I ask. I remember the last time you took me to the boathouse. Oh yes. I was in the moment. Oh, that was fun. In fact, I stop and scoop her up over my shoulder and she squeals. You were really angry, if I remember correctly, Anna observes while she bounces on my shoulder. Anastasia, I'm always really angry. No, you're not. I swat her behind and slide her down my body when I get to the door of the boathouse. I take her head in my hands. No, not anymore. My lips and tongue find hers and I pour all the anxiety that I'm feeling into a passionate kiss. She's breathless and panting when I release her. Okay. I hope she likes what I have planned. I hope it's what she wants. She deserves the world.
She looks a little intrigued and caresses my face, running her fingers along my cheek, to my jaw and chin. Her index finger pauses over my lips. Showtime. Gray. I've something to show you in here. I open the door. Come. I take her hand and lead her to the top of the stairs. Opening the door, I glance inside, and it all looks good. I step aside to let Anna go first, and I follow her into the room. She gasps at the sight that greets her. The florists have gone to town. There are wild meadow flowers everywhere, in pinks and whites and blues, all lit by tiny fairy lights and soft pink lanterns. Yes, this will do. Anna is stunned. She whips around and gapes at me. You wanted hearts and flowers. She stares at me in disbelief. You have my heart. And I wave at the room. And here are the flowers, she murmurs. Christian, it's lovely. Her voice is hoarse and I know she's close to tears. Plucking up my courage, I lead her farther into the room. In the center of the arbor, I sink onto one knee. Anna catches her breath, and her hands fly to her mouth. From my inside jacket pocket, I pull out the ring and hold it up for her. Anastasia Steele, I love you. I want to love, cherish, and protect you for the rest of my life. Be mine. Always. Share my life with me. Marry me. She is the love of my life. It will only ever be Anna. Her tears start to fall in earnest but her smile eclipses the moon, the stars, the sun, and all the flowers in this boathouse. Yes, she says. Taking her hand, I slip the ring on her finger, it fits perfectly. She looks down at it in wonder. Oh, Christian, she sobs, her legs buckle and she falls into my arms. She kisses me, offering me everything, her lips, her tongue, her compassion, her love. Her body is pressed to mine, giving, like she always does. Sweet, sweet Anna. I kiss her back, taking what she has to offer, and giving in return. She's taught me how. This woman who has dragged me into the light. This woman who loves me in spite of my past, in spite of my wrongdoings. This woman who's agreed to be mine for the rest of her life. My girl. My Anna. My love. E.L. James. Darker.